Hello, I'm David Dutton from Milton, Delaware. Today I'll be reading The Sandcastle from the Brave Light Press Anthology, Exhumed. The Sandcastle, Martin Gale Beach, summer 1925. The rickety wooden bridge had not improved since last season and would likely get worse before it got better. It was the only access to the small summer colony and would remain so until someone could talk the inhabitants into building a bridge strong enough to support the weight of vehicular traffic. Until then, summer residents housed their vehicles in a series of narrow wooden garages on the mainland side of the canal. Everything needed for their summer habitation had to be carried across the footbridge. Lewis Knight's left foot rested on the running board of the family Studebaker, which was parked in front of one of the garages. He turned and shouted to his wife, Beatrice, are you sure we've unloaded everything? Beatrice tucked a strand of soft brown hair under her wide straw hat and smiled. Yes, dear, I'm sure. If we've forgotten anything, we will just do without until Arthur can run across for it later. Okay. Adam opened the door so I can get the car in. Lewis pulled himself up into the driver's seat and started the big automobile. Eight-year-old Adam Knight ran to the garage and wrestled with, two, with the two heavy wooden doors. Despite a lack of height and brawn, Adam succeeded in the job he'd been given, and his father carefully guided the dark green touring car inside the tight garage opening. Mother, Beatrice Knight turned in answer to her daughter's cry. What is it, Jenny? Clara simply refuses to cross the bridge. I can't do a thing with her. Clara, the youngest of the Knight children, stood pouting at the foot of the steps leading up to the rickety wooden bridge. But mommy, I'm afraid I'll fall through the cracks. Beatrice started toward her daughter. Nonsense, it's all in your head. Now just walk across like you would the red bridge in town. I won't. That's enough out of you, Lewis Knight closed the garage doors and walked toward his family. I'll carry you this once, but from now on, you'll have to cross the bridge yourself. Lewis hoisted Clara onto his shoulders and turned to survey the rest of his family. Now, now is everyone ready? Beatrice laughed and straightened her hat. I think so. Arthur and James have already taken the water bottles across, so that should be about it. Jenny, have you got the other basket? Yes, mother, it's right here. Here come the Brewsters, said Adam, pointing toward the elegant Pierce era that had just turned onto the road. The sizable cobalt vehicle roared past as the two families waved to one another. Well, let's be off. Lewis Knight turned and climbed the few steps to the footbridge. The sun shone brightly on the row of summer houses lining the sand. A light wind stirred the beach grass. The seagulls screeched overhead as the knights picked their way across the bridge toward their cottage. Lewis hadn't wanted to own the beach house, but Be Beatrice had insisted. It was so much better for the children than being cooped up in town all summer, summer she'd argued. So they had bought the small house complete with, with a wide porch and three bedrooms that were just enough to accommodate everyone. It wasn't a bad place, and the selling price had been less than Lewis feared. With the exception of the Brewster house, which would have been an exception anywhere, the, lights, the Knight's residence was typical of most of the beachfront summer cottages. Anyway, they were here, and Lewis would enjoy it as much as the others once they were settled. He hated to pack and unpack after only traveling five miles from town, but that was the way Beatrice wanted it, and that was the way it had been. <clears throat> Beatrice stood in the little kitchen, stacking provisions on the open shelves. She was happy with her summer house. It had been a hard-fought battle, but in the end, she'd won. They had rented the little house for several years, and she thought it was simply a waste of money. Although they, although they could have afforded to buy the house in the beginning, Lewis wouldn't support the idea. However, when he was finally promoted to bank president and given a sizable pay increase to accompany the title, there was no reason for further arguing. Beatrice was happy. She had her children, her house in town, the beach house, and money in the bank. What more could she want? Beatrice turned from her task and looked out the narrow kitchen window. The huge mass of the Brewster house obscured her view of the untamed stretch of beach. While it was quite a house, she did not envy Margaret Brewster. 
A house of that magnitude demanded significant upkeep keep and maintenance. Of course, the Brewsters, whose pockets were deep, regularly outsourced cleaning and repair tasks to locals, as they certainly didn't intend to spend the summer months performing home maintenance and upkeep. The Brewsters and the Knights maintained a polite, nodding acquaintance. While they had summered side by side for the last five years, the families had little in common. Margaret and Edward Brewster were from Philadelphia. Beatrice imagined they were from one of the aristocratic families for which Philadelphia was famous, but that was only speculation on her part. The Brewster's only child, Chase, had ga graduated from college the previous year and then taken up employment at his father's firm. Beatrice had learned that Chase recently married and that the newlyweds were planning to spend the summer at Martingale Beach with his parents. The slamming of the screen door woke Beatrice from her reverie. Clara and Jenny, Jenny ran into the kitchen, tracking mud everywhere. They had been to the mud flats that bordered the canal. Unfortunately, this would be a regular occurrence throughout the summer. Beatrice could never understand the girl's fascination with getting covered in mud. It was a tight squeeze getting the big Pierce Arrow into the narrow garage, but Edward Brewster finally maneuvered the car into place. The unloading had already been accomplished. It was now simply a matter of hauling. Edward handed his son two big baskets before picking up two more. You know, it really is good to be back. I never knew I would miss it so much. Chase shot his wife, Rebecca, a sarcastic grimace. I don't see how anyone could miss that monstrosity. He motioned to the large yellow and white confection with its ornate tower. It dripped gingerbread and confused the eye with its many gables and dormers. Chase, don't talk like that. After all, someday this will be yours. <coughs> Excuse me. Margaret Brewster handed a suitcase to her daughter-in-law and then picked up another. You young people simply don't appreciate everything we try to do for you. She paused and issued... <coughs> Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> she paused and issued Rebecca a challenging stare. What do you think of it? Rebecca hesitated and then smiled. It's quite nice. I like it. I'm so glad you do. Perhaps you can entice your husband to change his attitude about it. Edward and I worked tirelessly to create a retreat that our family could enjoy. Edward shouldered another bag. Well, I think that's everything. He took a deep breath and started across the bridge. The two couples trudged through the sweltering heat while the gulls continu continued their course above. Rebecca kept glancing up at the huge house, oblivious of Margaret's eyes upon her. Chase slowed his pace until he was in stride with his wife. Don't mind, Mother. She thinks this place is the end of the world. Rebecca laughed. It is. You mean you like it? Rebecca smiled in Chase's direction. Heavens no, I think it's perfectly horrible. Why ever did they build it? They didn't. Mother did. Dad hates the place. So do I. As far as I'm concerned, it would make wonderful firewood. But your dad just said he'd missed it. He only misses the beach. The house means nothing to him. He only built it to pacify her, to stop her from constantly complaining. I hope it'll never be that way with us. Chase smiled. It won't. Edward unlocked the front door and threw it open to the sun. He stood aside to allow his family to enter. Margaret immediately walked through the foyer and into the big living room where she began to open the heavy draperies. Chase leaned clo close and whispered to Rebecca, what do you think of the interior so far? It's a bit overwhelming. Chase laughed. Wait till you see the rest of it. At his laugh, Margaret Brewster turned to glare at the couple. Chase ignored her look. Where are we sleeping? Margaret continued with her task. You may have the front room. It will give you a, view, a nice view of the bay. Chase picked up their bags and led Rebecca up the wide walnut stairway. When they had disappeared, Margaret turned to her husband. He stood in the archway that separated the foyer from the drawing room. Why he married that girl, I'll never know. 
Edward looked at his wife and sighed. Maybe he loved her. Oh, Edward, let's not be funny. Well, dear, some married people do love one another. It's not that unusual. Margaret ignored her husband's comment and finished with the last of the draperies. Edward watched his wife for a moment and then opened one of the French doors leading onto the wide porch. I think I'll take a walk on the beach. Margaret turned with glaring eyes. Don't you dare. There's all this unpacking to be done. Edward smiled and closed the door behind him. Rebecca followed her husband down the long, dimly lit corridor. It was oppressively hot. The walls were dark, the carpeting was dark, the whole effect was cla claustrophobic. Chase, why do you always disagree with your mother? It only makes her worse. Chase ignored the question and threw open the door to their bedroom. If you think the rest of the house is bad, wait until you see this. Rebecca gasped. Oh, my dear, it's, it's very, very red, isn't it? Yes, well, technically it's Gypsy Rose, but yeah, it is indeed very, very red. Chase laughed again and pulled Rebecca close. Do you think you can tolerate it here for the next few weeks? Rebecca kissed him softly on the lips. With you, I can stand anything, even this ghastly mausoleum. The sun was hot on Arthur Knight's back as he sat working in the sand. Even though he was 15, he still enjoyed building sandcastles. He'd been building them for as long as he could remember. And his father said that was one of the reasons Arthur hoped to be an architect. Arthur, come on in now. It's time for dinner. Beatrice, Beatrice's voice traveled clearly through the thick summer air. I'm done. Come down and see it. <coughs> Beatrice stepped from the porch and picked her way across the sand. I wonder what you were up to. We haven't seen you since lunch. She stopped and looked at her son while wiping her hands across her apron. What have you built this time? Arthur looked up at her and smiled. Don't you recognize it? Beatrice laughed. Why, it's the Brewster face. Anybody would know it. Do you like it? Oh, yes. <clears throat> You'll have to show it to your father. But why did you build it so close to the water? When the tide comes in, it'll be washed away. <coughs> I know, but the sand here is wet and doesn't dry out like that further up the beach. You can work with it better. Well, I see. Well, you'd best get cleaned up for supper. We're having the crabs that Jenny and Clara caught off the old jetty. Little Adam rested his chin on the back of the sofa under the big window facing the bay. The waves came in long swells and were breaking softly against the sandy beach. The tide had turned about an hour before while Adam and his family were eating dinner. Soon the waves would swirl around Arthur's sandcastle. Adam hated to see it go because it was the best that he could remember Arthur having ever built. It looked exactly like the Brewster place, down to the tall round tower that was so unusual. Maybe, with any luck, it would survive the onslaught of the tide, and Adam would be able to see it again tomorrow. At the Brewster house, dinner had been nothing short of a trial. Chase was glad the meal was behind them, but he worried that the rest of their stay would be equally painful. Chase hoped that by spending time together, they would become more of a family. He knew his mother disapproved of his marriage, but he loved Rebecca and wanted his parents to do the same. <laughs> Now, in their bedroom, Rebecca pulled back the heavy brocade bedspread, accompanied with elegant silk sheets. She sat on the bed and tucked her filmy nightgown around her legs. Well, that was fun. Chase stood at the window and stared out at the bay. Yeah, a real picnic. Rebecca sighed and slid down under the sheet. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Chase laughed. Do you really think so? One can hope. She leaned back against the big feather pillow. Your father's not so opinionated, but your mother, she's a real joy, Chase said, or rather killjoy. Rebecca was silent. Chase continued to stare out the window. The wind was picking up and the tide was rolling in. They could be in for a, a blow before morning. He sighed, closed the heavy drapes, and climbed into bed beside his wife. Chase ran his finger across Rebecca's brow and then kissed her smooth lips. I love you, Rebecca Brewster. Rebecca smiled, and I love you. 
Chase awoke with a start. The wind howled and the windows, windows rattled in their frames. He lay there listening. There was no rain, only wind. The house shuddered with each violent gust. Above the assault, the sound of big waves pounded the beach. Never had they sounded so loud. Something was wrong. His reverie was suddenly broken by his mother's scream. Chase jumped from the bed, waking his wife in the process. Rebecca sat up and reached out to her husband. Chase, what's the matter? I don't know. He left the room and headed for the staircase. His mother screamed again. Mother, what's wrong? As Chase reached the top of the stairs, water poured into the foyer, dissolving the front port, the front door in its path. It took him a moment to process, process the event. The door hadn't splintered, hadn't collapsed. It had simply dissolved, leaving a trail of wet sand on the foyer floor. Chase descended the stairs two at a time, but before he could reach the bottom, the water had lapped over the first two steps, the newel post, and part of the railing. Only clumps of wet sand remained. Chase, <coughs> Chase hesitated, grasping the baluster. Mother, where are you? Her voice was distant. Here. Where? In the drawing room. He looked toward the archway. In the dim light, Chase could barely see his mother. She stood on a chair, clinging to one of the ornate columns. Chase, what's happening? Rebecca called from the top of the stairs. Chase turned and looked up at, at his wife. I don't know. Just stay where you are. Chase turned his, returned his attention to his mother. Mother, where's father? Margaret Brewster sobbed. Gone. He's gone. More water poured into the house, dissolving everything in its path. The front wall had almost disappeared and there was no sign of the big front porch beyond. All that remained were lumps of sand being molded and scattered by the constant waves. Chase began to panic. What do you mean? Where's he gone? His mother sobbed again. One moment he was on the porch, the next gone. Rebecca started down the stairs. Chase? He gazed up at her. No, stay there. Chase looked back at his mother. Mother, stay where you are. I'm coming to you. Margaret Brewster began to cry. Just as Chase was preparing to jump over the stair railing, a huge wave invaded what was left of the first floor. The chair supporting Chase's mother dissolved, and she pitched headlong into the swirling torrent. Chase stood in horror as his mother little, literally melted before his eyes. She didn't cry, didn't make a sound. <clears throat> Chase gazed in dis disbelief for long seconds before recovering. He turned toward Rebecca. Rebecca, you need to get back in our room. Not until you come back up here with me. Chase started to ascend the partially dissolved stairs. Another hungry wave assaulted the foyer, instantly washing away the remainder of the staircase. Chase reached out to Rebecca, and then the waves consumed him as well. Rebecca screamed as the upper floors of the house collapsed. The waves greedily devoured walls, floors, and ceiling ceilings with equal hunger until only a smooth, sandy surface remained. The warm summer sun woke Adam Knight as it flooded his bedroom with morning light. Adam sat up in his narrow bed and rubbed both eyes. The boy had slept hard, not waking at all during the night. <clears throat> Across the room, his brothers continued in their slumber, just lumps between, beneath the thin sheets. Adam stretched before, before swinging both feet over the side of the bed. He reached for his trousers and singlet and donned both. There was no need for, for hose or shoes. He was at the beach. As quietly as possible, Adam padded down the hallway and then down the stairs. Silence filled the house. No one appeared to be awake. Adam opened the door to the porch and stepped out into the warm summer morning. For a moment, Adam paused, unsure what to do with this modicum of freedom. Then he remembered Arthur Sandcastle. Without further hesitation, Adam jumped off the porch and sprinted toward the beach. The morning sun was already warm, and even at this early hour, the seagulls continued their never-ending cries. The sand felt moist and cool against his bare feet, but Adam knew that by noon the sand would be hot and dry. 
Adam skirted the clumps of beach grass and soon topped the last dune before the beach. There he paused and scanned the beach and the gentle waves breaking upon it. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but he saw no sign of Arthur's creation. Slowly, Adam walked down the sloping sand, pondering where Arthur had built the castle. He combed the shoreline as far as he felt was feasible. There was no sign of the sand castle, of any sand castle, only smooth white sand. In the distance, Adam noticed an area where a lump of sand marred the surface. He supposed that might have been it, but had no way of knowing, and guess it didn't much matter. The sandcastle was obviously gone, devoured by the hungry waves of the prior evening's tide. <clears throat> Disappointed, Adam sighed as he turned back toward the family cottage. Then he stopped and stared. Something was different. Adam stared at his family's cottage and the expanse of sand that abutted it. What the heck? Adam ran a hand through his thick hair. Where's the blue Brewster place? The big house simply was not there. It had been there yesterday, of that he was certain. It had stood next to his family's modest cottage for as long as he could remember. Now in place stood a smooth mound of sand. Adam shook his head in disbelief. Adam thought to himself for a moment and realized that maybe he was wrong. Maybe there'd never been a Brewster house. Perhaps the Brewster house and its occupants had been nothing more than a part of his eight-year-old imagination. Overhead, the gulls circled in the sky, their screams echoing up and down the coast. Well, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the story, be sure to pick up a copy of Exhumed at gravelightpress.com. And to find me on the web, visit dwdutton.com and check out my uh, recently published novel, One of the Madding Crowd. See you next time.